Hi, Pierce. Uh, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, now, I just want to introduce this conversation by saying that uh, we're conducting this interview against a backdrop of increasing restrictions on our movement. And people will say that specifically in cars, the movement in cars. Um, but across the country, we're having uh, various programs uh, imposed on us, such as uh, low emission zones in London, low traffic neighborhoods in Oxford, and even um, a talk is being seeded in the public consciousness of 15 uh, minute neighborhoods. And these are affecting uh, motorists in all towns and cities to some degree or other, these restrictions. So I th the point is that it's based on the premise of that, that we are causing a man-made climate emergency. Now, I understand that's something that you disagree with. Is that right? It is, I disagree with that completely. It's uh, fake physics and fake data. Now, over the past two or three years, anybody who questions the government narrative has been uh, often told, like, you know, what are your qualifications? You're not an epidemiologist, you're not a vi virologist, and so on. So um, I'd just like to ask you what your qualifications are to speak on this subject. Okay. I've got a first-class degree in physics from Imperial College and, um, and theoretical physics, and I've got an MSc in astrophysics, and I've uh, run a, uh, I do run a long range weather forecasting company, which was floated on the stock exchange. And um, I uh, uh, obviously had to have a lot of checks to do that. And I'm continuing to run this as an independent organization. We're not on the stock exchange anymore. Our long range forecasts are unrivaled in terms of their look ahead period, which can be months ahead down to certain details so we understand the weather and the climate and what controls climate um, that shows that we know what we're talking about uh, in terms of man-made climate change which is like a side issue if you like i can also demonstrate that that is complete nonsense now on the street the uh, the man in the street will say to you but all scientists agree on this subject so <laughs> What, well, what do you say to that argument? That first statement is false. Um, we've got this pamphlet here, uh -huh. scientific papers by myself and uh, Philip Foster, a fellow physicist. And there it uh, reports on a paper by Dr. David Leggetts in Science and Education in 2013, where he analysed this claim that 97% of scientists believe in man-made climate change and showed that that claim is false because... It's based on a list of papers, they're valid scientific papers, but the papers themselves do not claim that man is the cause of things. They do say uh, they investigate CO2 and what CO2 is doing here and there. But of those papers, um, only 0.3% of those papers claim that, quote, man had caused most post-1950 warming. And uh, uh, about 3% said there was something going on maybe with man, but not the claims cited in the media. So those claims are a lie. Um, now, as to, you want me to talk about the actual theory now? Yeah, because I was going to ask you. Um, so again, I, we've got to keep it fairly simple for like people like me to yes. understand. So, um, but, so what we are told that carbon dioxide is a threat to us in that it is causing global warming or that we shouldn't produce so much carbon um can can you address that like is carbon dioxide is that no, a threat to us? No. carbon dioxide is the gas of life in geological past co2 levels were 10 or 20 times higher and life abounded the carboniferous period was huge growth of forests and that's what gave us the coal measures that we have um so carbon dioxide is not bad it's a good thing and we want more of it not less so Next question, is carbon dioxide causing changes in climate? No, it causes no changes in climate whatsoever. Uh, data over the last well, few million years, but specifically in detail over the last 20,000 years, shows that carbon dioxide levels in the world follow changes in temperature. Follow changes in temperature. So the CO2 is not cause, the CO2 is effect. That is a fact, 
and both sides agree with that. And there's a graph on here, on page five of our little pamphlet, uh, scientific paper, which you can download from weatheraction.com. So that should end the argument. Now, of course, they say something like, oh, yes, peers, but the extra CO2 produced at the end of this process of, and so on, will cause warming. Well, it doesn't. The graph here, the upper graph there, you see, you can see that, does not show an increase in temperature following the CO2. It's a nonsense. It's a lie. There's nothing going on whatsoever. Now, even if, even if, you accepted that CO2 was causing climate change. You just have to ask yourself, well, what about how much is man's contribution compared with the total flow of CO2 in and out of the sea and land on a daily basis? The answer is that man's flux, with all his machinery, is 4% of the total flux. Termites produce 10 times more CO2 than man. So if you're worried about termites or worried about CO2, you should have a war on termites rather than a war on the place. Let's be clear. That's okay. what the NASA should do. They should have flamethrowers and destroy termites around the world. But they don't do that. They know it's lies. We know it's lies. The only people who don't know it's lies are public and brainwashed politicians. I've, I've heard you give an interesting uh, like visual analogy with reference to Big Ben about how yes. much carbon. Can you repeat that for us? Yes, please? indeed. Yeah. Right. If uh, Big Ben was the atmosphere... Uh, and the top of Big Ben is the top of the atmosphere, then if you imagine how much CO2 is that, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere would be like an inch and a quarter on the top of Big Ben. And man's contribution to that CO2 would be a bird dropping on top of that. So we're meant to believe something the size of a bird dropping is controlling what happens in that whole Big Ben. It is Utter nonsense. Now, I've been to numbers of meetings where I've challenged them to have a full debate on the matter, and they never, never, never agree to have a debate. Which and is This is published. Nobody has published a rebuttal of this. They could do. If they had something to say, they could. Instead, they lie and lie and lie. And, you know, physics on this field is corrupted. I don't, I don't mean, well, it is corrupted financially, certainly, because of money shoveled in. But it doesn't mean people are stealing money. The point is money is shoveled in essentially to bribe them. You know, to if you don't do this, you won't get the grant. So if people are interested, I took down the figures from your pamphlet there, which people can yep. see on your website, weatheraction.com. And um, it said that CO2 is 0.04% of air. That's right. And man's contribution to that CO2 was 4% of the 0.04%, which, which is basically your bird dropping. Um, it's, it's a fractional amount of the total CO2, which was the Big Ben analogy. Now, the other thing that uh, you were explaining there is that uh, the, the temperature follows, sorry, the carbon dioxide, uh, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere follows temperature increase of the earth right. and the atmosphere. So, um, you had another interesting analogy for the layman, for someone like me to understand, mm -hmm. yeah. is that is that the oceans act like a fizzy drink. Can they you do. talk us through that, please? Yes. Well, the reason why CO2 levels follow temperature is because of the oceans. 70% of the globe is covered in water. And like a fizzy drink, um, if you warm a fizzy drink, CO2 will come off. If you warm the oceans, CO2 comes off. Colder oceans will, of course, take in more CO2. So that is what's the controlling mechanism. I know when, mad, when man or termites or somebody adds a bit of extra CO2, what, what happens? Well, it goes into the sea. It, unless the sea is too warm, then it will come out, be coming out of the sea. But the CO2 will control it. But anyway, we also know that the CO2 is not controlling temperatures in any way, even a feedback mechanism, not in any way whatsoever. So, so what you're saying there is, if I'm correct, I'm just clarifying this, is, is that there has been a period of warming, which has encouraged yeah. CO2 to be released from the ocean. Yes. So any increase that we see in CO2 is, is due to a prior period of warming. Correct. Because there's a long delay. Yes. There's about, well, between anything between a couple of hundred and a thousand years delay due to the circulation patterns of the ocean. Basically, 
when there's extra CO2 in a warm period, such as the medieval warm period, it gets subsumed by uh, down currents in Greenland, uh, who have sort of colder down currents absorbing the CO2. They take them under the sea, round them about, and they mostly come up in the Pacific uh, about some hundreds of years later, up to 800 years later. So the extra CO2 now is an after effect of the medieval warm period. So what do you say to, in, in response to like, in my lifetime, there's been prevalent in the public consciousness, this idea of the hockey stick effect, where we've had a period oh. of long, continuous, um, sort of uh, steady temperatures and man-made uh, actions have now created a, a visible rise, which looks like a hockey stick on a graph. Yes. Yeah. Well, that claim is fraud. It is utter fraud and a pack of lies. And they still... They're still cited. Um, there was a court case in Canada where a, um, a certain uh, Tim Ball took Michael Mann to court. That graph was produced by Michael Mann. And the graph, the lower graph on here is what the IPCC originally thought. Uh, and they changed all that by hiding the decline. And there was a big scandal um, of the University of East Anglia when some emails were released where they had talked openly, or well, not openly, secretly, on the emails of how they were going to hide the decline in temperatures that had happened since the medieval warm period. So in other words, they had a scam to flatten out the medieval warm period and then uh, also exaggerate current temperatures and make it look like obviously. That thing is fraud. The libel case um, was won by Tim Ball. Michael Mann was defeated. The judges said, no, there's no evidence for what you claim, Mr. Ball, Mr. Mr. Mann. And Tim Ball is right. And uh, uh, there's no way he can be liable. Um, how they've achieved this, as I said, is committing fraud, changing data sets in the past. And specifically what they do now is they cherry pick data where because of different circulation patterns there will be or is some warming going on compared with places which are cooling that's one thing they do two is they choose short data sets to alarm you like they have a, something a few years long uh, uh north uh west of cambridge say which is one they did in 2019 and said oh it's super hot super hot here well it was only super hot because of all the building around that new new weather station whereas the station's some way from there in the countryside showed nothing, nothing special at all. And the other thing they're doing is changing the data in the past. Now, this is utterly monstrous. They admit it. They admit they're changing data in the past. They just say we've got revised data sets and they've had 10 successive data sets in the last 20 years, um, which show successively uh, supposed warming uh, relatively currently and cooling in the past and we've put leaflets out about that as well now these are accepted data sets you can still get them from the met office or the climate research unit of east anglia or well various places you can still get the data sets and they're just labeled as you know labeled when they were produced but if you change the look at the data set say from some 10 years 2000 to 2010 uh, based on data, you know, one data set, then you look at that data set and the, that data on a newer data set, temperatures have changed. They reduced temperatures in the past and um, uh, uh, relatively increased them in the present, therefore. It's, we live in a fraud society in terms of climate science, so-called, just like we live in fraud uh, over, over medical things concerning uh, injections right now so 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 we are to take from that that it's fraud but then what do you say like if if we we're, we're given this idea that there's carbon dioxide and it's creating a blanket uh, above the earth why is that not going to cause warming if we're creating that carbon dioxide what the well, it's a nonsense it's, it's, not, it's not a blanket well I, I i cited this example when i was speaking in the 
um, Bundestag um, Environment Committee, and it was it was meant to be a committee, but it was a huge meeting. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. I get invited there, but the British Parliament, no, 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 they won't invite me. But in in Germany, minority parties have more rights. A minority party on that committee could say, "We want X to speak," and the chair has to allow it. In Britain, no, no, the chair says no. Piss off. Go away. We don't want the truth. So I was speaking in the Bundestag and I said, look, guys, see that? See those double glazing over there? Suppose that double glazing, whatever's in there now, is air probably. Suppose you replace that by CO2. Do you think you're going to get warmer in this room? And <laughs> they sort of looked at me. I suppose they're thinking, yes, I suppose we would. Well, I said, you know, in America, there was a company that created double glazing filled with CO2. And they were selling this. And of course, it didn't make any difference. It didn't make anything warmer. It's a complete nonsense. And, you know, it's not difficult to understand why it's complete nonsense. Because, OK, CO2 is in there. How does the CO2 know which way to send the heat? Which doesn't know which way is inside, which way is outside. Of course it doesn't. It's complete bollocks. It's utter, complete fraud and lies. And look in detail about the Earth. OK. Suppose that CO2 up there is sending extra heat down here. All right. Well, it will, in a way, because it's a radiative absorber and emitter. So it will absorb more that's going up and will emit coming down. But there's also CO2 on the ground in the lower atmosphere. Well, that is going to emit more upwards. Now, it's actually warmer lower down than higher up. So the net effect is going to be more going up than more extra going up than the extra coming down. So that will actually mean a net expulsion of energy. So that would be a cooling, not a warming. So it's all complete lies, absolutely. And in more detail, if you want to get technical, what they say violates the second law of thermodynamics. What they require is that heat in the upper air, where it's colder, is transferred by this process somehow to down here where it's warmer. That is heat moving at will, from a warm area, to, sorry, to a cold area, to a warm area. That is complete nonsense. If you want to save electricity now, why don't you just put a cup of tea in front of you and wish it to warm up? That is what they believe. It is nonsense. It is lies. These people should be expelled from universities. They are liars, cheats, frauds, criminals. Okay. They should go. We've got to have accountable science back in this country. And... Bear this in mind, every tyranny requires the end of science. Every tyranny. Russia, under Stalin, Germany, just the same. They had to end science because they had these bogus science theories, the master race theory. Couldn't talk about it, though. If you did, you're in trouble. If you argue certain things in the Russian Academy of Sciences, you weren't there next time. That is how they work. They have to suppress science. To suppress science, they have to suppress democracy. So the end of science and the end of democracy go together. That is what we're seeing. OK, so if, if it's not the blanket of, of CO2, what is the driver of the change in temperature, of climate change? What would that be? Yeah, the driver of the change in temperature is solar activity. Um, it's not so much the amount of radiation from the sun, though that does change a little bit. Um, the key thing is the magnetic connection between the sun and the earth and its strength. And that affects the amount of particles coming uh, from the sun. And those particles in various ways change the uh, way circulation works. So they change what's called the jet stream, which is the division between the colder air to the, above the, to the north in the temperate zones and the warmer air. This is in the ocean, the jet stream that comes from... Like, no, no, the jet stream is in the air. The okay. Gulf Stream is the one that Sorry, goes. yeah, okay. It's okay, no, okay. The Gulf Stream does get affected too, so that's, that's not, not a silly thing to say at all. Um, but the jet stream is that wavy pattern around the globe. Um, as I said, north of it is going to be the colder part and below it is, is, is the warmer part. And where, there's the, where they meet, you've got cold air meeting warmer air, circulation, low pressure systems and so forth. And these move around the globe. And the jet stream becomes more wavy uh, in certain times, basically when solar activity is generally lower. And um, 
when it becomes more wavy, it also shifts further south, so it becomes cooler there. So that is the key change. It's about the change of circulation. So is that happening now? Is that what you're describing happening yes. now? It is happening now. So what we should... That's why, Sorry, yeah, why you will get more cold periods. You will get some very warm spells mixed up with the cold, but they're generally going to be shorter than the cold spells. Um, that is what's happening now. So, so we have had some you know, quite unusual bits of warm and then some really blasting cold. We've had the lowest record recorded temperatures are on, on existing data over hundreds of years in Siberia recently. And that is a sign of, uh, you know, what is happening uh, around the world. What's happened in Siberia is very important for the whole circulation pattern. So just to make sure that I've understood that correctly, the jet stream fluctuations, if we were warming, should be making the poles warmer, or the jet stream uh, yes. should be moving north, for example. No, the, the jet stream uh, will move... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it should be if we were getting warmer. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll, yeah, it'll move upwards, it'll move northwards if we were getting warmer, yes. Yes, and what it's instead doing is going wavy. Wavy and shifting south as well. Okay. Yeah. So the increased waviness and the shifting south go together. I mean, as an example, during the um, uh, more than minimum period of solar activity, uh, we had the Great Fire of London which was preceded by what's called the Belgian wind, which suggests everything bad, bad comes from Belgium. Um, OK, and that was a very hot wind and London was parched and then somebody lit a match to make some money, we suspect, and uh, anyway, the rest is history. But the winter following was hyper-cold and the Thames froze over. So, uh, you know, these things go together. The, the Belgian wind wasn't a long thing, but, of course, the cold, cold winter was a long thing. So that is, 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 is the point. Um, Extremes of both sorts, but the colder, bigger effect than the warmer ones. So that is evidence that the, the, the jet stream provides us evidence that we are uh, getting cooler rather than warmer. Correct. That is true. The amount of ice in uh, the Antarctic has been increasing for the last 50 years. The amount of ice in the northern hemisphere uh, and the date of, well, the greatest snow cover extent, uh, both of those things have, uh, have uh, got uh, longer. Sorry, the ice in the northern hemisphere is now going up and the extent of uh, uh, snow every year is now goes on to to later so we're and that's over the last three or five years there's been cooling in both hemispheres and we're reaching a rapid feedback situation where when the ice cover gets bigger in the northern hemisphere the reflectivity of the northern hemisphere goes up and you the the winter then absorbs less heat so the spring starts later and the summer is, is shorter basically and that will then make it even more ice next season. And we're now in this feedback mechanism. So it's going to be rapid cooling up until 2030 or 2035. You also mentioned there the ice cores, and I read your pamphlet that people can obviously see on, on the website. Um, yeah, download it from weatheraction.com. Yeah, and you mentioned the ice cores. Do you want to speak a little bit about what Philip Foster said about the ice cores? And um, he, he mentioned that it was an un underestimate. Yes, 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 he did. Quite important because when you pull out an ice core, the pressure from, you know, very high pressure down there is released. So there's carbon dioxide that's uh, dissolved under pressure in the ice, then boils out. And you, you can hear it. So you can hear the whole thing. Was, this ice this is coming out. So then the measurements of the CO2, which they do then, are, of course, going to be underestimates of what is actually in there. So although in terms of looking back in the past, you can see the fluctuations, the actual overall amounts in the past would have been higher. And it's difficult for them to estimate how much higher. I mean, I think they admit that this must be the, must be the case. Um, I suppose you could try and capture the CO2 coming off and, and measure that. I don't know. But there's obviously big difficulties with that. And he points out in his, his paper that uh, it must be that the estimates of CO2 in the past are generally, using ice cores, are generally underestimates. Okay. Now, something that, that you might get asked in the street, like, uh, say, if you're speaking to people, is that why... why um... 
why were, are the oil companies like uh, how are they involved in this because <laughs> well <laughs> they make money out of oil prices going up now the getty foundation funds just stop oil let's go that i'll repeat that the getty foundation billionaires oil magnates fund just stop oil and just stop oil prance around saying that Oil companies are the enemy. No, no, no. Oil companies are their friends. And it's pretty simple to understand because the effect of a just up oil is to, well, when the um, OPEC uh, accepts their demands and reduces uh, uh, oil production, oil price goes up. So for Getty and all those oil magnets, it's a no-brainer. Look, support all this campaign against us. Reduce oil supply say we haven't got enough oil price goes up and they will lose a small percentage of world energy production to wind farms and such as your nonsensical stupidities they will but that's just one or two percent and instead they will double the profit on the 96 percent of world supply of energy through oil and coal it's a no-brainer a complete no-brainer and, you know, you tell this to people in Just Stop All and they're so stupid, they won't even listen. But it's a no-brainer. Anyone in business can see these games that go on. And interestingly, the uh, rector, now they renamed themselves president of Imperial College, not the current one, she was caught um, having a consultancy with, uh, I think it was Chevron. And people said, look here, this is ridiculous. You've got a consultancy with Chevron and you are trying to be a green university. And uh, she, she lost the job. I mean, she was going to leave anyway, maybe, but, you know. But, of course, it was all part of the whole thing. Chevron were working with Imperial oh. to propagate the climate lie and make more money. That's why they were consulting her. Okay. That's, um, <laughs> that's, that's something that people are not really aware of, I don't think, because they yeah. presume that... And if anyone wants to say that's untrue, I challenge into public debate. Bring along Imperial College Board, Board of, uh, well, the governing body. Bring along anybody. They will not deny this fact. I mean, she wasn't hiding it herself anyway. I mean, it was a consultancy. Well, why not? I mean, she's, she's in charge of Imperial College, offered money to give it information, advice, and quite likely be told what to do in order to get a big grant. Who knows? But you see, they will do these things to get big grants. They will do. And that is a big problem with uh, modern higher education. Bill Gates shovels money into Imperial College. Bill Gates shovels money into the BBC. This is absolutely corrupt. We should not allow any funding of any big pharma or energy companies into higher education or, or the mainstream media. They ought to be completely terminated. We've got to have an accountable mainstream media. And people who run these institutions should be up for election. The rector of Imperial College should be up for a public election. The director of the general of the BBC should be up for public election. OK, thank you. Um, I know you've got to go soon. And I think, All right. I think that's um, pretty much covered what I wanted to say. I just want to finish just by saying um, I, I just maybe the last question to you. Um, this in no way suggests that you, you want to be anything other, other than a, like a custodian of the earth. You don't want the place to be polluted and you don't want, you know. No, of course not. Of course not. No, we're against real pollution. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, when Sadiq Khan says he's saving the planet by keeping cars out of London. Well, actually, no, because they're just making cars drive further go around a ring road instead of across London. So they produce more CO2, more, they do produce more CO2 too as well, but they produce more smoke. And anyone living near the uh, M25 is where he wants them to move to, or the North and South Circular, is going to get more pollution. Let's be clear. Look, if you want to combat pollution, what I suggest you do is combat pollution. You can make all that money they're spending or robbing people of um, could be used to improve catalytic converters to remove smoke in vehicles. That could be done. But they don't want to do that. They want to control you. And I think it is worth understanding a bit more about the bigger picture on the control. Right. What they're talking about now is saying the car is the enemy. And because it produces CO2, they say. And it produces smoke, too. That's true. 
and we can remove the smoke I said we want more CO2 not less but the car is the enemy and people are trying to be brainwashed into car is the enemy okay and the 15 minute zones and all that are to do that um but uh, their arguments actually don't make sense because of the reasons I just said. But also, what about these 15-minute zones? Look, they say it'd be nice for people to be able to shop within 15 minutes of where they live. Well, okay, let's just build some more shops. You do not need to prevent me driving my car from A to B in order to allow people to walk to a shop 15 minutes away. They are completely unconnected things. It is absolute lies. It is nonsense. It is brainwashing. And people are so stupid as to think that stopping a car driving is going to help them walk to a shop. It's completely insane. We have to sweep away all this 15 minute zones in one statement like that. The low traffic neighborhoods are the thin end of the wedge to 15 minute zones. The 15 minute zones though, in the long run, are not just about controlling cars. You think about it, because you've got other controls going on. Masking, not allowed here or there without a mask. Jab, have you got your jab passport? Not allowed here or there, lose your job. So all those things are about control of motion, in and out of buildings, in and out of jobs. Everything they're doing now is about control. And the real reason, I think, for these 15 minute zones, clean air zones and all that is the surveillance cameras. They're now everywhere. They're watching you. And if they'll have such good pattern recognition with 5G, they'll be able to say it's you. And oh, we know your face. We know. But you had an argument with a politician recently. Oh. And also, you didn't pay this bill or that bill. You want to get on the bus? No. Your credit is turned off. That is what social credit is about. So people have to use cash, 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 cash. And we've got to destroy, we've got to take down. Can't say destroy them there, I'm sure. But <laughs> the idea of having these cameras has to be destroyed. The cameras must be taken down. The clean air zones must be taken down. We have to defy them. Now, I have amounted now so-called fines of £34,000 for driving at will in Euros. Now, we know these charges are illegal because they're issued by a computer. Uh, there will be a big court case or Sadiq Khan will give in. Six London boroughs are now saying they do not want the ULES extension to, uh, to outer London. That's a lot of people, a lot of people. Now, Labour, of course, is dithering around. Telling, they're mostly Tory boroughs saying this, but the Labour opposition's there. Oh. I can't imagine them doing anything other than following suit. Right now, Labour and Tory are the same in Parliament anyway. There's completely no difference. So people should ignore the parliamentary circus, drive at will, defy all these limitations on our freedoms. That is just one. The other one, of course, is brainwashing to get jabbed. Uh, where you get ill and will you may die all right i've actually uh, <laughs> that's I mean, i've just got one last thing to ask yes, you sure. about no like problem. it's a little question about so we've been told that co2 levels are too high yes um but is there a suggestion that they might actually be dangerously low well there is and philip foster goes into that actually which is which is very important because um through evolutionary time the efficiency of uh the stomatal pores which let the oxygen in and out of leaves in trees has increased so we're now in uh photosynthesis type two i think but, but there's both types of working in parallel um and it, they can't really get much more efficient you see the stomatal pores is so so clever it can a co2 molecule come in it'll get snapped snapped up and bump into something i don't know how it works but they, they are efficient um but there's a limit you see and if co2 levels go down further then plants will die they won't be able to get enough um or they'll just grow very very slowly i, I don't know what will happen but basically vegetation will, will go down and down um whereas if it's more co2 it'll go up and up and up like in the Carboniferous period, which must have been incredible. Maybe you could almost see trees growing. I don't know, but they could support, you know, dinosaur life and incredible amounts of stuff. And everything was going so fast that trees would collapse and uh, get compressed and turn into coal. Whereas now, of course, trees get consumed by little tiny animals or funguses and so on. So that we don't have coal, which is going down now. But leaving that apart, no. 
CO2 levels are now becoming dangerously low. And we're being told the opposite, so it's inverted, really. You see, it's a one-way ticket. Life forms take up CO2, and eventually they turn into crustaceans and seashells. Calcium carbonate, the white cliffs of Dover, that is CO2 that was way, way, way in the past. Um, that would have been before the coal measures. Those CO, though, that CO2 was taken out of the atmosphere before the coal measures took it out. Um, and that is a, it's a one-way ticket. Uh, the only way to reverse that, you could, well, you could pour lots of acid onto under the white cliffs of Dover, I suppose, <laughs> make, make CO2. In fact, you know, in a thousand years' time, that might be what people are seriously going to do. I mean, seriously, they'll need more CO2. All right, Piers. Th thank you very much for speaking to me. Um, and you. Uh, and uh, people can find you on your website, weatheraction.com. They can download the pamphlet or, or just read it online on the screen. Yeah. Um, you'll find it on the right-hand side of the page on your website. Good. Yeah. And also come along to stopnewnormal.net where we've got information about current campaigning and let the UK live.com, which is our main organisation and also uh, it's a political party as well to enable us to support candidates in elections. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And my last parting shot, resist, defy, do not comply. Thank you, Pierce. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.